the Lightroom Guru. Hey. And we are here to answer Lightroom questions today on behalf of Photo Focus. This is our monthly Photo Focus Lightroom Hangout. And our last one for the summer. Last one of the summer. Yeah. Labor Day is upon us. It's the end of the season. Yeah. It's feeling kind of relaxed. It's been a really nice, just gorgeous, perfect summer here in New England this last week. It's just just beautiful. So looking forward to getting back out there and enjoying it. Um, so we have some questions, I think, in the feed, huh? Yes, although before you do that, tell me tell me where you're going to be next week, Rob. Hey, I, I think I'm going to be where you're going to be. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> off to Photoshop World. Uh, this will be number 19 for me. Oh, excellent. And, uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Look forward to it twice a year, and uh, I do work there, so I get to help out behind the scenes. Get to see uh, folks I only see twice a year, and it's it's always really exciting to do that in Las Vegas. So that's uh, even more exciting, and uh, it's always a good time. And this year, or this one, I should say, this is going to be pretty special because we've got a lot of photo focus folks coming in, like you, right? Yes, I'll be there for sure. This is my third uh, Photoshop world, and we are doing some really fun stuff. We we've got we've got this complete studio setup that we're doing at Photoshop World. We're going to be doing video interviews and portraits and audio interviews with all the gurus there, all the all all sorts of wonderful uh, vendors and and uh, photography industry people. It's going to be cool. I'm is there are there some open Events too, like is there a couple things? There's so many things going on. I'm kind of having a yeah, sure. Um, there's there's a post on the website on Photo Focus right now that you definitely want to check out because we're doing a breakfast on is it Thursday morning or is it Friday morning? I I, I don't remember. <laughs> so anything, go to photofocus.com and find it. That's, yeah, we've got the uh, so many things going on every day. I think there's stuff. and then there's just Photoshop World too. But right. And so we'd love to see you there. If you're there, I will be doing uh, my Steve Jobs portrait project in the Mac Fun booth. Oh, good. That'll be cool. Yeah, I want to. I want to get one. Yes. <laughs> get the step ladder. Yeah, I usually <laughs> I don't have a, lot, a whole lot of free time there usually, but usually when the expo's open, I, that's when I have my most free time. So. Oh, good. That's when it is. It only takes 12 seconds. So. Oh, good. All right, I got. I can. I can carve out 12 seconds for you. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and I also should say that all of our past Lightroom Hangouts, uh, there's this is our eighth one this year, so they're all on photofocus.com, and there's a whole Lightroom Learning Center as well full of all kinds of posts from you and myself and uh, Nicole Young and uh, Vanelli. V, he'll be there if you're a friend. Okay. If you know, if you've been to Photoshop World, you know Vanelli, and he'll be there, uh, and he's right in Photo Focus now. So lots of good stuff in the... Uh, in the Lightroom Resource Center there. Right. Right. Rats, Rob, I, I think I went the wrong order, and I didn't enable the uh, Q&A thing before we started. Oh, OK. So well. A live question you want to ask us, put it on the on the Hangout feed. Just just post it right there. Or on the event page on, on Google. Page. Yeah, on Google. We'll watch for it right there. I see there's already some there. There are some there. There are yeah. some. I've got some people sent me also offline, so we. I got lots of questions to answer. So. When David. <laughs> well, I have no shortage of questions. <laughs> Does my hard uh, drive just crashed on my main workstation where LR is installed? I have backups of photos and data, so no problem there. Easy enough to reinstall LR and PS with CC subscription, but what about all my presets? Do I have access to most of the data on the old drive? If there's a way I can harvest them somehow. In particular, develop presets I use for importing and exporting. Thanks. So he lost his drive. Yeah. Well, his when he says um, when he says he has backups of photo and data, data is a uh, is the key word there. So it, there's lots of ways people do backups. So if you're backing up your data, to me that means like everything. You know, uh, all of your except for your maybe your programs that you install, but all your like Word documents exactly. and all that kind of stuff, then in that data, that lump of vague dataness, uh, David uh, 
if you want to reply on there, David, and maybe give us some more info. But in that data, you might have your presets uh, backed up, and uh, that would be great if you do. Um, and as you say, I'm looking to see if he's on Mac or Windows, but uh, it doesn't say. But um, I'll post a link on the event page that Adobe has listed out where all where you can find all the files, um, all the Lightroom-related files, so you can maybe... The presets by default are stored a little bit kind of buried, but uh, if you've been backing up your kind of whole system, then you might have it, uh, and that would be great. And then if you do, you can grab those files and uh, just put them right back where Lightroom expects them to be, and you'll be good to go. Now, Rob, if you if you've backed up your catalog file, are those are those not included in your in your catalog file? No, no. Presets are separate. Um, let me. I'm going to grab that link and post it in there. Um, well, and honestly, for me, I'd I'd be more concerned about the catalog file than the presets. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like he's got his photos, and it sounds like he's got his catalog. And that's the most important right there. Photos most important, obviously, because you can't replace those. Uh, catalog second most important, because that's where you've done all your work, and you don't want to have to redo all that work. So you got those two things, you're really 99% of the way there. Uh, presets, you know, if they're ones that you made, yeah, you, you, it would stink to have to recreate them, but you could. If right. they're ones you purchased, yeah, maybe you could just re-download them. So that's definitely lower on the totem pole of importance, but... Um, but still, you might you might have them. So I'm posting I'm putting a link on the event page right now for that has all the preference and other files. So you can look in your backup and see if uh, at that location. But um, if you have Lightroom running, all right. So there's two places where Lightroom stores presets, and by default, maybe I'll share my screen and I'll I'll show you that. Uh, <laughs> Got so many windows open here. <laughs> Where is the hangout window? Oh, here it is. Hey, there it is. Usually it's a separate one, but now I've got it all in there. Okay. All right. So if we go over uh, to, and I'm on a Mac here. So if you go under Lightroom and Preferences, and go to Presets. There's this button here, Show Lightroom Presets Folder. Yeah. Now, if, you're, if you're on Windows, it would be under the Edit menu. You can go Edit, Preferences, and then Presets, and then Show Lightroom Presets Folder. If you open that up, it's going to open up a window in Finder. If you're on Mac, it'll open up Windows Explorer uh, if you're on Windows. And you'll see this Lightroom folder is highlighted, and go into there, and then here's all of the presets that you've installed by default. This is the default location. So... You can see here on mine, it's my hard drive, user account, my username, library, application support, Adobe, Lightroom, and then they're all in there. Awesome. Right? And if I look in my develops, so there, you know, there they all are. And so if you include this folder in your backup, then you've got it. You've got all your presets and templates and, and so on. Uh, and the same would be true on Windows. Now, if we go back over to, to Lightroom into that preference, if you check this box, store presets with this catalog, that means that Lightroom is going to create a special folder right alongside wherever you store your catalog, and, it, and that's where all presets from that point on are going to be stored. What it doesn't do is it doesn't, when you check that box at first, it doesn't automatically bring in any custom presets you've already created, so you have to kind of manually do that. But from that point on, the downside of, uh, of checking this box is that if you have multiple catalogs, then uh, you wouldn't be able to access all your presets across all of your catalogs because they're tied to a specific catalog. So only check this box if you have a workflow where maybe you store your catalog on an external hard drive, and you do that because you move that hard drive between multiple computers, and you want to have all your photos, your catalog, and all your presets on this drive and have it as this kind of portable little package. That makes a lot of sense to do it that way. Otherwise, uh, I don't really see much benefit by checking that box if you really only have one catalog 
and it's only on one computer and that kind of thing. Because the other benefit of leaving this unchecked is when you upgrade Lightroom to whatever version comes next, that new version of Lightroom will create a new ver will update a, a copy of your catalog, and it's going to look to the same place. And that way, you're not kind of losing leaving your presets behind either. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of questions about that when people uh, upgrade Lightroom. They they're worried about their old presets not showing up in uh, in Lightroom. So if you just leave that unchecked, leave it in the default, then then that's where that's where you go. So Excellent. You. That's a great tip. Yeah. That's so. Uh, if he has more info on that to follow up, I'll try and follow up too. But that's hopefully he's got it. And all you do is put them right back where they were, or put them right back in that path where Lightroom expects, and you're good to go. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, well, looking here, at the next next question, there you wanna? Yeah. So he's, this is uh, Matthew Gowan says I've got 1.5 terabytes of photo data in Lightroom. I haven't backed any of this up yet. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> USB 3.0 drive for this task. Can I simply copy and paste data from the hard drive, and will that retain LR edits, or is there a specific window workflow to follow to archive slash backup my images? Oh, Matthew, Matthew, Matthew. <laughs> well, obviously he knows he's in he's in imminent danger. When you put in yikes, once you once you once you announce it to the world, you know uh, that's right. You're in trouble. So. Can you copy and paste as a form of backup? Yeah. I mean, that's essentially what a backup is, is copying data to a new place. But a much better alternative is to use software that is designed for that purpose. Because it does two things. It, it One, it actually does multiple things. But one of the most important things is it, is it takes it out of your hands because you can then just set it up and kind of forget it, and it just runs. So it's automated. Uh, that way, it's not dependent on you to remember, copy, paste, that kind of thing. But also, most of the backup programs are smart these days in that they only will back up data that is new or changed or maybe removed if you've been deleting stuff. So you don't want to be copy-pasting you know, one and a half terabytes of data every time, right? That would be, that would be a waste of time um, when maybe, you've only, maybe only a very small portion of that is new and another small portion has changed. You just want to make sure that you've got the latest and greatest changes and, and new information. So if you're on a Mac, there's Time Machine. That's the kind of the classic backup. Uh, I use a program called Super Duper. So I, my, my laptop is a Mac, and uh, I just I have an external hard drive um, somewhere in my, my desk pile here that I just um, clone using Super Duper. And SuperDuper has a smart function, and it just it literally clones everything that's on my laptop drive to this uh, external hard drive that is equal or greater in capacity. You want to make sure you got one that can handle the same amount of data. And it even makes that external drive bootable. So one time I had uh, my laptop accidentally, I don't know how it happened, but a bottle of seltzer <laughs> exploded all over my keyboard because I opened it too close. And luckily, it only took out my keyboard. Um, but what was another lucky thing is while that was get in the shop getting fixed, I took that external drive and just connected it to an old Mac laptop that I had, and I was able to run essentially everything uh, that I had on my current laptop off that bootable backup drive. And that, that really made my life a lot simpler until I got my uh, working laptop back and uh, was able to just very seamlessly continue working, even though... Uh, my my really my workhorse machine was was out of my hands. So that's one way to do it. So uh, on on Windows, there's other software on my Windows machine, which is desktop. I use a program called Vice Versa Pro, and that does a similar thing in that it automates backing up all my data and my photos to uh, Drobo that I have, uh, and then that Drobo is then backed up offsite. So. Backup is a huge, huge topic, but the very, the very least, I guess if you, for now, if you just did a copy-paste, so you just went, whew, I've got it in two locations, uh, that might be the, the safest thing, quickest thing for you to do. But I would suggest looking into a much bigger, long-term backup uh, plan. Uh, Levi, what do you have some thoughts on, on backing up, big picture? Oh, no, I think, I think that's, that's the right idea for the, for the backup stuff. Um, however, regarding... 
whether that retains your LR edits, your Lightroom edits. Oh yeah, so if you want to dive down specifically into what, so again, when people use the word data, okay, that's kind of a you know vague that's term. <laughs> um, Let's suppose he means photo files. Yeah, so Picture files. if we think about Lightroom as uh, kind of two main pieces, there's your photos, and those are separate. Okay, your photos are never actually inside of Lightroom. They're always just on your hard drive or multiple hard drives or whatever storage system you kind of use. And then there's your Lightroom catalog. Now, your Lightroom catalog is really just a database. And the only thing in that database is data. And in this case, it's textual information about your photos. It's all the EXIF metadata that your photos uh, kind of come with, shutter speed, ISO, that kind of thing. And then it's anything you do inside of Lightroom, like add keywords, add color labels, uh, flags, then develop settings, and so on. All of that information, all that, every time you open up Lightroom and you start to do any kind of work, that information is being written into that catalog file, that database file. So you want to make sure you've got a backup of your photos in at least one other place, preferably more, and preferably one of those other ones being off-site of your location. So I feel like I have a good backup here in my office, but you know, if a meteor came down and took out my office, hopefully while I'm not in it, um, I want to make sure I've got my data backed up someplace else as well. Um, but when you're thinking about Lightroom, there's the catalog and there's the photos. So Lightroom has a function built in that allows you to schedule when you would like Lightroom to make a, a backup copy of the catalog, of that data, of your work, of the Lightroom edits. Um, and you can set it to be every time Lightroom exits, or it could be once a day, or it could be once a week, or once a month, that kind of thing. Um, I really recommend doing that because um, it, it it's automatic, it's scheduled, and it has an ability that... Um, Maybe I'll do my screen share again, and I'll show you uh, yeah. what that looks like. Okay, so let me close this, and um, so I'm just going to close. Well, first we want to go over to check where where to make that setting. So on Mac, again, Lightroom, and go to Catalog Settings. If this was uh, Windows, it would be Edit Catalog Settings, and then right on this General tab, there's the backup scheduling, all right? And every time Lightroom exits, this is what I have chosen. Now, this is personal preference. I like to have it nag me every time I shut down Lightroom. I don't back it up every single time, but I like it to nag me. That way, at least if I do it every couple days, it gets done. Um, right. If I set it to every week and I skip it, now I'm two weeks out. And you'll, yeah. anyone who's ever suffered a loss of a catalog or data, you know that, um, it's a pain in the ass to do the backup sometimes, but much bigger pain <laughs> when you are lost your data and the best best you've got is something that's two weeks old. That seems like not that long, but that could be really be a lot of work for some people. So I have it set to every time Lightroom makes it. So now when I just close Lightroom, Lightroom quit, I get this little dialog, all right? And it says, hey, you, set, you told me to back up every time you quit, so... Now's your chance. Now, this is your only opportunity to choose where you want that backup to go. By default, Lightroom is going to put it right in the same folder as your working catalog. Now, that may not be ideal because you want to make sure you have your catalog in two different drives, right? So if your regular full system backup includes where your catalog is and that's being backed up to another place and so now you're, you're kind of gotten double redundancy there, then maybe, maybe that's okay. But for this for this catalog that we're looking at here, it's actually that catalog actually lives on this uh, external hard drive. It's not actually on my internal hard drive. So what I have set up here is that when the backup runs, it stores that backup to a special folder in my Dropbox folder. Now I'm sure everyone knows what Dropbox is, but if you don't, it's just a free service. Um, although there's a paid option too, where you can have data stored in a folder on your system, and that data is automatically synced up to storage in the cloud on Dropbox servers. And then if you have any other um, machines running Dropbox, it automatically syncs it to that location too. So this catalog is being stored on my internal drive, this backup catalog, I should say. Um, but 
it's then being synced up into the cloud. So I'm, I'm kind of getting a little bit of redundancy there. And it's not stored on the same drive where my working catalog is. Yeah. I've, I've got another tip, Rob. Yeah, go. In addition to that. So popping over to screen share again here. Go to mine. Um, in that same catalog setting, so Lightroom menu, catalog settings, or edit menu, catalog settings on a PC. And under metadata right here, you go automatically write changes into XMP. Um, then it creates a sidecar file that sticks with your pictures. And that is very good. That means <laughs> if I open my pictures in Photoshop, it'll show the changes I made in Lightroom. If I, if I didn't use Lightroom to, to manage that opening, you know, like we, we always recommend, of course, that we use Lightroom to go to Photoshop. But if for some reason you didn't, if you've got this XMP uh, sidecar file, then, then Photoshop recognizes that and shows you your changes in Lightroom. Isn't that right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not preaching. No, you're, you're right. So um, it's important to keep in mind. So when, you, when you're writing to XMP, all right, that's an additional task that Lightroom is doing beyond writing to its own catalog file. So right. the, the catalog file is always the primary place Lightroom looks for information about your photos. Yes. And now, what I love to do here instead, though, is convert my files to DNG and then just hit save occasionally. And that writes the same XMP data into my file. Right? And right. Well, when you have um, when you have that box checked, if you have a proprietary raw file, so NEF, CR2, RAF, whatever you whatever you shoot, then Lightroom can't write or Adobe Camera Raw or Bridge, they can't write to that proprietary raw format. So they create this sidecar XMP file. Right. And in Lightroom, if you just, without, have, without having with that box unchecked, say, you can just press Command or Control S, and Lightroom will, will just do it manually. We'll just write mm -hmm. from, the, from the catalog to that photo's XMP metadata space. Right. So whether it's a sidecar or whether it's in the file itself, doesn't really matter as far as Lightroom's concerned. It's just that's that's where it can go. So so I don't I don't always need to check that box if I press save if I press command save. If you do the command control s, uh, then you don't have to. But I think if you're gonna if you're relying on that at all, then it's better to have it automated because yeah, then it just happens in the background. The downside of having that checked, and the reason why it's not checked by default, is that it can be a a performance lag. Right. Uh, it depends on your hardware and all that, but you're giving Lightroom another job to do, and if you're working on multiple files at once, you know, that can uh, increase uh, more dramatically. So that's why it's not checked by default. Originally it was checked by default way back in Lightroom 1, but people complained because it slowed down their systems. But hardware and the software has improved quite a bit uh, in those eight years, um, so you can try it. But keep in mind that there are certain things that can't be written to XMP metadata that you might want to uh, still, you know, preserve, and that's why your catalog file is most important. Right. So, like history, your catalog history, file. all the individual history steps, right, can't be written to XMP. I wish, I wish uh, PSD would keep your your history. You know, once you close a Photoshop file, your history is gone. Yeah, there's a way I think in Photoshop to have it write a history like text file out, but I, ne I don't, I never use that. So right, well, and, but the yeah, text file, one, yeah. The great thing in Lightroom is we can go back in time just by clicking. That's text. right. Yeah. So and then another thing is flag status can't be written to XMP. Right. Um, collection membership can't be written to XMP, and virtual copies can't be written to XMP. So. All that stuff only exists inside the Lightroom catalog, and that's why you're, you know, you want to definitely back up your catalog. If you also like this idea of checking that box and writing to each photo's own XMP metadata space, consider it kind of a belt and suspenders uh, approach. That's fine. Uh, the only penalty is really maybe potentially performance. Those XMP files don't take up really any room to worry about, so it's not like you're flooding your hard drive with... Uh, with files that take up lots of space. Um, so, you know, Levi does it. I don't do that. I don't 
I don't check that box. I just really trust my catalog backup process and my other backup process. And that said, I've worked with many people who, if they had checked that box, would have saved themselves a world of pain <laughs> because they didn't have a good backup of their catalog. Um, right. And that way, if you have your photos backed up and you write to XMP and you lose your catalog and you have no backup, well, then your only choice is to re-import from scratch, right? Well, if you re-import from scratch and all that work is saved in those XMP metadata files, then that all gets brought into the new import. And even though you lose your history steps, you have the most important, which is the final adjustments that you made. And that's what you really care about the most. Right. Uh, you, may, you may lose your flags, but you'll have your star ratings and color labels, keywords, captions, titles. So it, it's definitely something people should consider seriously and, um, and take advantage of. It's free. <laughs> it's right. There. Well, it sounds like we, uh, Matthew did some follow-up posts on there. sounds like we answered him pretty good, and he's got an idea for using Google Drive the way that you're using Dropbox, it sounds like, for backing up. So that's cool. Yeah, that, that, that could work, sure. And it looks like Marsha has a question for us. She says, how do we feel about converting to DNG upon import? Personally, I do it almost every time, unless I need more time. What do you do, Rob? <laughs> I never do it. <laughs> you never do it. I love it for, for two reasons, because of the XMP discussion we just had yeah. and because the files are smaller. And, yes, that's true. Uh, on my, uh, from a D800, it's a 20% smaller file. Yeah, yeah, well, that's... that's, that's, that's the, that's the benefits. That's really the benefits right there. Right. So uh, the reason I don't do it on import is just because I'm more impatient than Levi, apparently. <laughs> um, and I instead of importing and then go do something. Yeah. So you know that's fine. I mean, the import process takes lo you know long enough, depending on how much you shoot. If you're going to convert to DNG on import, that just makes it take a little longer. And then and this may be another difference between Levi and I. I often have photos to delete after I've imported. Levi, you know, he just nails it every time. <laughs> I so just need more of those, actually. <laughs> and so I don't feel like wasting the time converting to DNG files that I'm going to wind up deleting anyway. Um, so you can you can choose it. It's fine. There's no nothing wrong. I'm not, you know, this is not uh, something I feel strongly about. But if it works for you, I, I know plenty of people that do it, and they swear by it, and that's fine. I'm not, I'm not dogmatic in that way. Um, but just keep in mind, you can very easily convert to DNG after import from within Lightroom. You don't want to do the DNG converter because that would make that would make mess things up for you. Yeah. But right inside of Lightroom, uh, I can show you uh, that. Yeah, you can just select any picture and go to the library menu, right? Yeah. Oops, I got. <laughs> I'm still in the middle of my backup, so I'm going to skip my backup. And uh, there's my who says. And there's my last catalog backup file. So while I have this open, so a catalog, when it runs, when that backup runs, it only backs up your catalog file. It does not back up your uh, preview cache. And that's because the preview cache is something that Lightroom can regenerate any time. Um, and so it doesn't waste the uh, backup space uh, by preserving that preview cache. That's um, so, that's, so if you ever did restore from your backup catalog, just keep in mind that when you first open that, that catalog, there's not going to be any previews. And... Um, it's going to look kind of weird, right? So go to a folder that has some raw files in it. See, we're we're on your uh, we're not on screen share right now, Rob. Oh, no! I started to run it and then I well, and it, it, that. it also hey, there we go. Like, uh, Marcia says that she always does uh, DNG conversion, and you know, fifty percent of uh, of the Photo Focus Lightroom Hangout hosts also always do it. Yeah, fifty percent. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with it. But just so you know, so here I am in the library module, and I just selected a folder, and there convert photos to DNG. So if you uh, you like to use the DNG workflow, by all means use it because there's some definite benefits to it. Um, but just know that if you're impatient like me, you can uh, just import with a copy and then make your edits, and then when you've got what you want to keep, convert uh, to photos to DNG and let it run in the background or let it run while you're going to go off and make dinner or whatever you're going to do, and then it's done. Uh, and you end up with the same result, which is a folder full of DNG files, and it, it, you can set it to delete the uh, original raw files. So 
Yeah, yeah. and you can watch your file storage increase. As you can yeah, what I tend to do is uh, do it as an archive step. So kind of after I've done the processing and weeded out the weak ones, uh, and I want to try and recover some hard drive space, then I'll just do it that at that point, and, uh, and, that, yeah. and that works fine for me. There's so. there's, there's another thing. Um, oh, and I I recommend that people do that as well, but I don't recommend that you go in and select all from your entire catalog and start converting to DNG. Yeah, that that would I would not do that either. You down completely. So don't do that. Just as you as you go through and happen upon some some raw files that that you haven't touched in a while, just convert those. You know, on a case by case basis, um, but also converting to DNG from the uh, from import is also less disappointing. <laughs> it's less yeah. disappointing. Yes, because because that little that little preview doesn't pop up of your JPEG preview showing you how bright and colorful your picture looked, and then go blah to the Adobe standard. Uh, yeah, it only shows you the Adobe standard unless you also import with a preset. Setting your camera profile, which is what I do in, in camera calibration, I set a profile for. Yeah. And maybe that slows it down more to apply that preset. It probably does. Yeah. Well, you know, there's there's no one way to use Lightroom and and to do this stuff. What I find, you know, from working with so many different people, is there's so many ways that work for people in their own way. And what I just try to help people is understand kind of the bigger picture. So they can make their their choices intelligently, and maybe sometimes they go, oh well, I just didn't. This is just the way I learned it, and that's the way I always did it. But now that I know that I can do this, I might you know make some changes because that works for me, not just because I said this is the way you know it has to be done. Right, right. Um, I think we missed one question. Uh, well, maybe not. No, I think we're good. Oh, I did. No, Lawrence had a question. No, I think he just uh, commented. Oh, he was just piling on the other one. So I think we got him. Oh, right. okay, yeah, all right. But uh, let's pretend there was a question about something in uh, develop. <laughs> <laughs> let's do a fun question. All right, you got one lined up. Do you have any other? Let's see. Um, how can I tell which presets I've used on an image? That's a little more. Uh, I like that one. And that one's tricky. That's, yeah. That's a that's a toughie. Um, one of the things. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen with you. And Rob, you, you can probably help answer this one better. But uh, one of the things I like is that if I've created a preset for an image, let's go to an image that's not a surgery image. <laughs> um, if I go to into develop module, are you seeing my screen? I am. Are, is everybody else seeing my screen? They're not. Okay. No. Now everybody's seeing my screen. <laughs> Seeing an infinite me. Yes. There we go. Um, if if I go in here and click on one of the my my presets, then that preset stays highlighted. Uh, right. Yeah. Now scroll down to your history panel. Yeah, and there's there's the preset that I've yeah. applied. So that's a great way. Just look at your history panel to see what. Presets have been applied. Yeah, so yeah, that's you know people will ask that, uh, and sometimes that maybe doesn't tell you enough <laughs> because you may not know what that means. So because yeah. um, the trouble with it is that it it does something in camera calibration, it does something in detail, and it does something in tone curve, and it does something in in split toning, and so it it's making a lot of little adjustments that you may not. Um, immediately notice all of them all at once. And so yeah, so the only other way to kind of know what's in a preset is to, you can open it in a, in a plain text editor. It's really just a text file that has a bunch of settings in it. And you can try and parse that out. Some of it is somewhat arcane looking, but most of the, most of the times you can make sense of what it is. Um, or you just take an unprocessed photo and you expand all those panels and you click it and you go and look and see what changed. Right. <laughs> and uh, you make a note of it. Um, a lot of people, you know, they just don't sweat it. But some of the questions that kind of come after that are, or the reason why they want to know is because they want to know if they can stack a preset. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about that? Sure. So you can absolutely stack presets. You can hit one preset and then another preset. Excuse me. <laughs> Woo. 
But if you do that, and let's say one preset includes a setting that the other preset had, the, the latest one is going to overwrite the previous setting. Well, it depends, right? So say I have a preset that the only thing it does is it uh, adds plus 10 clarity. That's right. all it does. And I have another preset that is uh, minus 10 clarity, and that's all it does. Mm -hmm. So I click on the plus 10 clarity preset, and you see the clarity slider go to plus 10, right? Now, if I click on the minus 10 clarity slider, I mean on the minus 10 clarity preset, the clarity preset, uh, the clarity slider doesn't go to zero. It doesn't. It's not subtractive or, or additive. It goes to minus 10 because that's it's an absolute setting. And so in that way, um, it's not like I'm able to like dial down clarity by increments of 10. It means I'm setting it to either plus 10 or I'm setting it to minus 10. Right. It's so that's what a, that's what presets do. They they hard code in some setting and they move the slider, whatever the slider or checkbox is, that's what they do. Um, here's here's you know, an example of, of that same thing. I've got this set of, um, of split toning presets. So this one sets me to blue. Right over here you can see it added some blue. And then if I hit the next one for geranium, it, it changes the color. And because that's the only thing that these two presets do, it's affecting those, it, it's only affecting this spot. But if this one also affected um, exposure, then it's going to change the exposure and this area. And then if right. my next one affects exposure differently, it's going to reset to that thing. So you, but if it doesn't affect split toning, then it won't touch the split toning, and my previous split toning preset will work. So you can stack them until they interfere. <laughs> yeah, and that's why, you know, sometimes it helps to, when you, you know, if you either make a preset to create folder structures that help you organize and understand what they affect. Um, if you buy them from someone or if you download from free, then maybe it takes, so take a little time and explore, uh, explore them, play, play with them, see what settings change. Maybe the, the creator of that preset has already outlined what settings are included. Sometimes they do that. Uh, that way you can maybe use them more intelligently and you're not maybe working at odds uh, with yourself by you know, applying this preset that does m magical stuff and then you go and add clarity and sharpening or whatever, and you're really just changing the settings that were in the one preset that you thought you were applying. So right. that way it helps out. Excellent. Excellent. Um, what's another good question that we've got on there? Let's see here. Covered the backup stuff. I've got one that... Uh, Someone sent me that it's really kind of a common question, and um, there's a couple ways that you could approach it. And a lot of the questions I get really on the, I answer all the questions for uh, Kelby One uh, for the help for the members, all the Lightroom questions, and a lot of the stuff really comes down to a lot of stuff we've been talking about, which is really just uh, the maintenance stuff, the like kind of boring. Uh, humdrum, uh, moving stuff around, and or a lost stuff kind of questions. And so one that uh, one, one kind of that covers a lot of that is uh, the the running out of space question. And this one is I, I use an external hard drive to store my photos on. I just bought a new uh, larger external hard drive to move my photos over to it. When I start Lightroom, it's not showing this drive in the folders panel. How do I get Lightroom to see this new drive? And that's a kind of a, a, a common question and a common misunderstanding about what Lightroom is doing and what it's capable of doing. Maybe I can... Um... As, you, as you look that up, Rob, let's, uh, let's remind folks that we're, we've got a prize to give away today. Oh, that's right. Back Fun is giving away a uh, license for Tonality Pro, which is their new black and white plugin, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that. I've seen a lot of examples of that. I haven't got a chance to play with that yet. But yeah, it's... I've been playing with it a bit, and uh, I am a fan. And <laughs> so uh, we're going to draw from those who have asked the question and see who wins. And we've got uh, 15 more minutes of this show. So, so they can just ask any, even a, the smallest Lightroom question, if they want to get in on that on the uh, event page. Yeah, drop it on the event page, ask yeah. the question, and that will enter you in the drawing here. Um, all right. Well, while, while you're thinking of your questions to get in that drawing, I will 
uh, share my screen here. And so in the folders panel, in this example, I've got th what looks like three drives showing here. Um, one is my internal hard drive. One is this external hard drive that's uh, attached via FireWire. And then what here is my phone. So this is because I use Lightroom Mobile. Um, and so when I, uh, it's not actually attached to my phone, but it kind of creates this thing like it, like my phone is attached. Um, and this is not a file browser like Finder or Bridge or Windows Explorer. This only shows uh, what data has been added to this catalog. And right now, if I had another external hard drive connected, it wouldn't just automatically appear inside of uh, my folders panel. I have to somehow either make Lightroom aware of it by maybe importing photos that are on it, or I can actually add a new folder uh, and make that folder be on the external hard drive, and that way it would bring it in that way. So one way to do that, if I go up to the library menu, I can choose this new folder menu item. You can use the, the plus sign on the folders panel. And if I go down to my external hard drive, these are the two folders that are on it. One contains my catalog. One contains the photos that we were seeing here before. But say I wanted to add a new folder on here. Let's pretend that this is not a drive that I'm actually using photos with. And I just say this was a brand new drive that I wanted to move some photos onto. I can click New Folder. Whenever I have a new drive that I'm going to store photos on, I always create a single parent top-level parent folder that they all go in, and I always call it imported photos, because that way then it tells me when I'm looking at that outside of Lightroom that all the photos in there, well, I've already got that, uh, oh, are being managed by Lightroom. And that just kind of reminds me that I don't need, I don't want to be messing around there uh, unintentionally, because that'll mess up my Lightroom catalog. That's a good idea. So now I've created this folder on that on that particular drive, and I click Choose, and that drive's already on here. But now that folder disappears. So if this drive hadn't been already on my system, now the drive would just would appear at that moment when I created this new folder. And now I can just drag and drop a folder or a single photo right onto that other folder, and Lightroom's going to say, hey, you want me to move that? And I'll say, I could say yes, but I'll say cancel because I don't really want to do that. All right, and so uh, that's one way that you can move photos to another drive. Now, another way that if I were to really wanted to move all of these photos, um, then maybe to be a little uh, to be a little safer when you're moving large amounts of data, I don't like to use Lightroom's move function because a move function is a copy operation followed by a delete. And if that external hard drive accidentally, I know I have two cats, <laughs> so if it got suddenly disconnected, then I could potentially lose some data in that process if it was in the middle of that uh, operation. So a safer way to do it is actually, this is one time when you, want, you can actually do something outside of Lightroom uh, to your benefit. So I'm going to go to uh, that external hard drive. And so here's that parent, that top folder that was already there that has all of my photo folders. And then here's this imported fo photos two folder that right now has nothing in it. What I could do is say grab a folder and I want to just copy it. And I'm going to paste it into this other folder. And right now Pretend this is two separate drives so it doesn't seem ridiculous. Um, so now I've actually duplicated that particular folder in this other drive. Now if I go back to Lightroom, it still does not know anything about it. All right? But what I can do is right-click on this 2005 folder and go to Update Folder Location. All right? And I want to go find that place where I made that copy and select it. And what this is doing is saying, Hey Lightroom, I want you to update where you're referencing these photos to this new location and pretend like that other location doesn't exist anymore. And I'll click choose. And so now it disappeared from here and now it showed up down here. 
So if I were moving a whole drive's worth of data, I would do it outside of Lightroom. I would copy all of the data in the exact folder structure it is. I don't want to. I don't want to take this opportunity to mess things up right. and move things around. I'm just going to literally copy and paste it from the old drive to the new drive, and then once that's done, so let's pretend that I copied all of these folders, including this top one. Then I would just right-click on that and go Update Folder Location, choose the new location, and then, boom, Lightroom just updates its database, its catalog, to reference the new location, now ignoring the old location. And then once that process is done, I can go back and outside of Lightroom, I could go to the old... So if we look here, we can see that 2005 folder is in both places. It's only being referenced now in this new location. Lightroom is not tracking this old location. So I could go ahead and delete that. And it doesn't affect Lightroom because Lightroom is tracking those over here. Right? So just imagine that on a large scale data move. Um, and that makes that a lot simpler. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's something I've been using. That, that's a tip you, you gave me a while ago, and I've been using that quite a lot. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's not an intuitive process. I'm just going to move that back. So I can, and then when, if you ever have a folder inside of the folders panel you want to get rid of that's empty, just go to remove, and then boom. It's gone. Yeah. Now back to the way it was before. Well, thanks, Rob. So. Cecil has a terrific question that I've always wondered that I don't know the answer to. He says, I've created an external drive for my older images. It now appears below my Mac drive. Is there a way to move it? Above my Mac drive, how can we reorder the, the, the drive structure in Lightroom? And why does it randomly change order? Do you know? <laughs> I don't know. Um, that's not something that, uh, well, it's not something I know, but it's not something you can change. So you can't change a volume name. Um, and... I can't say I've ever, I've ever seen another drive appear above my internal hard drive. I have, like, like right now. Did I did I switch to a, yeah? So looking at mine, sometimes my files drive right here is above my hard drive, and sometimes it's not. This big huh. picture one is usually down here somewhere. I don't know what is. Uh, yeah, everything else inside of Lightroom, whether it's the uh, the other actual folders inside of a drive or collections, presets, templates. Everything sorts alphanumerically, right. except for the the volumes. On Windows, it's drive letters, so it's not even names. Right. Um, right. So, I'm sorry, Cecil. I don't know that it's possible. I'm, I'd love to know if it's possible, but I don't. I don't know of any way to affect that change on there. Uh, Cecil, you stumped us. You did. You stumped us. And I'm going to go with it's not possible, but until proven otherwise. <laughs> right. So. I'm gonna find out. I'm gonna find out next week at, at Photoshop World why it changes randomly and how we can change it. No. Yeah, what the good thing about going to Photoshop World is that Adobe uh, always has a booth there, and a lot of the Lightroom as well and Photoshop uh, product managers are there. So um, Tom Hogarty is usually there. Shard um, English is there. Uh, Julianne Cost, uh, who is the evangelist uh, for Lightroom, and she is just she's my Lightroom hero. Uh, she doesn't know it, it's not possible. <laughs> Many of those three don't know it, it's not possible. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other people um, uh, there as well uh, on the Adobe side. And then, of course, there's all the, the Photoshop guys, Scott and Matt uh, and RC and everybody there. So there's a lot of great people to ask those questions to. Uh, and maybe, maybe someone there knows. I'd love to know it. I always love to learn new things because... I don't know everything. I know a lot of things, but uh, I don't know everything. And a lot of what I do know is because of people asking those kind of questions, and then I get to go do the research and, and dig it up and find out. So, um, so thank you, Cecil. For yeah, and it's those, those little tweaks that really make you sound like a genius, too. <laughs> yeah, well, everything's easy when you know how, right? That's right. That's absolutely right. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's wrap it up here a little bit, Rob. Yeah? What do you say? Um... There was one more thing that uh, I had gotten offline. It's a real quick one. Oh, good. That, that seems to go past people. Uh, all of a sudden, I lost all the info on the imported images, like file number, exposure info. I know I've done something, but can't figure out what. Um, and so 
I'm going to share my screen and go back over to Lightroom. And so looking at uh, these thumbnails here, what I understood that to mean was this information here where I see the uh, shutter speed and aperture and ISO and file name and file type. Hey, look, there's a DNG file, see? <laughs> yeah. um, and that might, be, might have gone missing. So there's three different, this is grid view of the library module. There's three different grid view styles. Right. And if you press the J key, it cycles through them. And so this is one of those things where it's really easy to accidentally bump a key, and also everything's gone, and you have no idea uh, what changed and what happened. So once you know, it's easy. You just press the J key again, and you bring it back. If you don't do that, you can also go up under the View menu and go down to Grid View Style, and you can check different things here, and that will change how these look. So if I uncheck that, it changes. If I go back, Grid View Style... Turn up badges. So there's, you know, there's different things you can do to change the way that uh, these grid views styles look. And you can also config configure what data shows there by going over to view options and clicking on the grid view tab. And then you can choose what you want to have appear inside of uh, all these different areas. Right. Um, Very cool to be able to customize. Yeah, and you can also, when you're in this particular style, you can actually click right on these little uh, data displays and change it that way too. So that's another another cool thing. Um, there's a lot of little hide and seek type things that Lightroom likes to do, and so just because I know this, I get this every week. I get this type of question: is one of the panels will go missing on somebody? <laughs> right? And so if you right click on a panel header, and this is true in any of the modules, you'll see this little contextual menu appear. If I uncheck Quick Develop, that panel's gone. Now, it's easy to accidentally do that and go all of a sudden, you go, oh, my basic panel is gone. Oh, my keyboarding panel is gone. Or whatever panel is gone. I swear that question comes in every single week. Wow. Um, yeah. If you know it, it's easy. You can just right-click on any of the other panel headers and click check the box to make it come back. You can also go to the window menu, panels, and then find that particular panel and bring it back that way, too. Excellent. Um, so that, that happens that happens all of the time. Um, the toolbar down here is another one. Press yeah. the T key. Because it happened so much, they they added that kind of delayed uh, little uh, bezel that appears to tell you what you did, but sometimes people still miss that. And then all the things that are in the toolbar, sometimes people wonder where those go. Way down on the right-hand side, there's this little arrow, and you can make those appear, and you can choose what you want to have in that particular toolbar. Um, so Lightroom does a lot of, there, there's a lot of keyboard shortcuts that can help you if you understand what they're doing, uh, but sometimes it's easy to inadvertently click one and find yourself in a different mode or a different view, and that can be uh, disconcerting. So if that ever happens to you, if you're a Kelby One member, you can send the question to me, and I'll answer you. But the other thing to do is just look up Lightroom keyboard shortcuts and you might find that the T key is the culprit, uh, or the H key. Yeah. If, you're in, if you're in develop and you're using an adjustment brush or a radial filter or a graduated filter and you hit the H key, you're going to hide the pin. Uh, hit the H key again, and it, it brings it right back. So lots of those little things that drive people crazy and waste time, uh, those are the kind of questions I love to help people out because they can just relax and get back to doing their, doing their work. Uh, that they came to do. So. Yeah, and in, in, the, uh, in the loop view, if you're looking at a single picture, either in library or develop, if you press the I key, you get, uh, you get that information in the top corner of your screen as well, toggling on and off. That's uh, another spot where people might lose it. Yeah. Um, I just saw a new question came in. Is there a link that shows details on creating a new folder and moving data? Well, yeah, there is, actually. I have on my blog on lightrumors.com a whole bunch of tutorials that pretty much all have derived from help desk questions at some point, and uh, the move one is a popular one. So I'll post that link in the on this event page here, but if you go to lightrumors.com and you can do a search on moving folders, you'll find it that way, too. But I'll, I'll, I'll put it in there, Deborah, so you can follow along at home. Excellent. Well, thanks, Rob. Thanks for your help here. And Thank you, Levi. You know, I'm excited because I'm hoping that next month 
I'll be able to join you in the Tetons. Yeah, that's right. I'll park. And, <sighs> and it's at summer mode. Yes. Yeah, so we'll be, uh, I do a few workshops a year through the digitalphotoworkshops.com, and our first one is in uh, Grand Teton National Park, and uh, that'll be in the end of September. Um, still have some openings if anybody wants to join us, but uh, Levi's going to be there. That'll be great. Brian Matthias is our guest instructor, and his lovely wife, Nicole Young, is actually going to come along as well. And my I'm going to have a walk with them tonight. Oh, nice. Well, tell them I said hello and look forward to seeing them next week at Photoshop World. Um, yes. But on the, our workshops, we, we have a great time. We spend a lot of time shooting. And when we're not shooting, we're in the classroom learning post-processing on everything from basic Lightroom stuff to HDR processing. And um, we do a lot of light painting at night. We do star trails. We, we uh, do the classic sunrise, sunsets. Um, in Tetons, we have the added benefit of doing some wildlife shooting because that place is just chock full of yeah, buffalo, antelope, moose, bear. I mean, it's just a, it's just an amazing place. And uh, it's a beautiful time of year. Last year, we were there at the same exact time, and we had snow. <laughs> so we could have some beautiful fall foliage colors and a little bit of frosting of snow. So it's a great yeah. time. Yeah, and then you've also got the the Moab and Yosemite workshop coming up. The rest yeah, so we got our our second one for this year is uh, Moab, where we're, we spend most of the time in Arches National Park, and Nicole Young is our guest instructor for that, and uh, Brian is coming along. <laughs> They're kind of a package yeah, deal, uh, and uh, that one's really almost yeah, full. Right. We've got a lot of people signed up for that one, um, and then our Yosemite one, we is actually we moved it to next year. Um, oh, okay. Partly because I had a schedule conflict, but partly we're, we were so concerned <laughs> looking at poor California yeah. uh, being so dry and uh, on fire and earthquaking, <laughs> we decided to give it a year to recoup <laughs> and hopefully get some water, send some, do some rain dances for California and uh, every other place in the world that needs a little bit of rain uh, right now. So. Excellent. So, yeah, so we'll have our the rest of our 2015 calendar up uh, hopefully by the end of Photoshop World or at least before our Tetons trip. So we've got a few more ideas for some different locations for next year, too. So. Terrific. So we'll see you at Photoshop World. We can catch up those workshops. Where else can we catch up with Rob Sullivan? PhotoFocus. Uh, it's probably a place where uh, doing more blogging than any place else uh, in our Hangouts every month. And... Um, we need to nail down our, our calendar a little bit for next month, but I think we're going to have a really special guest. Uh, we're going to have Matt Kleskowski on next month. So yeah. we've got to work out uh, a date that works for all three of us, but he's he's willing to join us, and that should be a good good show. Um, and, yeah, so what about you, Levi? Where, where else can we find you? Well, so I'll be at Photoshop World, and you'll find me on photofocus.com, and then I'd love to have you join me for... A cruise. <laughs> We're doing a, a Caribbean cruise with uh, some terrific instructors. We've got Michelle Celentano coming, um, Bobby Lane, Lee Veris, and uh, Julie and Justin Morantz, or Justin and Mary, Justin and Mary Morantz are coming to, to teach us uh, wedding, business, portrait, commercial, Photoshop. It is going to be a terrific workshop. And where's, it's Caribbean. Where's the port? Where's... We're sailing out of Houston. You can find all the details at scuwinterbreak.squarespace.com. I'll, uh, I'll post a link to that. In cool. The that sounds awesome. And, oh, it, it's it's going to be a great time for sure. There's, I mean, January. Who wants to stay wherever you are? <laughs> anyway. True, true. I'll be here in New Hampshire in January. Come down to the Caribbean with us. <laughs> oh, that sounds fantastic. It's, it's, an, it's an affordable cruise, and... Um, an invaluable education experience. So that's, yeah, that's no, that sounds like great. great well, will you pick our winner? I sure will. I've got a random generator. Told us it's question number two, which I've got as um, Lawrence Hartwell. Yeah. Well, if you're present, you've got to be present. <laughs> if you are present, be present. Raise your hand. Yeah. And if, if, uh, if a little, then a little poster there that says, I'm here. <laughs> that's right. 
if you don't let us know you're here, then it's going to go to uh, to Matthew Gowan for the Tonality Pro from Mac Fun. That's Mac M A C P H U N software, and they've got some terrific stuff. So thanks, Mac Fun, and thank you guys for joining us. Yeah, we'll thank you, everybody. Shop world. And I'm putting that link on the event page now as my final act. Perfect. There. Or we'll catch you next month on the Lightroom Hangout. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Hope to see you at Photoshop World. Come say hi if you're there. We'll see you soon. All right.